God named King David, who by the spirit of revelation had the eyes of his heart illumined and opened, that he could see things about your majesty and your beauty. And I ask you to open the eyes of our heart, that that spirit of revelation that was upon David would be upon our hearts, that we could see and operate in the spirit of might. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel 17, we're not going to look at it verse by verse because, again, the focus of this course is discovering the beauty of the Lord through the experience in the eyes of David. So we will reference a bit of the story and then go to where David reveals what God has shown him through the book of Psalms. The title of this session is called The Spirit of Might. The Spirit of Might. And then I would put colon... The beauty of divine courage. And what David is, is empowered to see is a little different than what we saw last session where David looked up at creation and saw the beauty of God. There's a magnificent script, if you will. There's a magnificent blueprint. There's a plan from which God the Father has been operating from, from before Genesis chapter 1, from the beginning of human history. And David is allowed to see this divine script. He's allowed to peer into the blueprint from which God is orchestrating human history. Now when David sees this wisdom, the majesty of the wisdom, the certainty of where God is taking His people, one of the outcomes of that spirit of revelation was the spirit of might. We call it in the New Testament the spirit of faith. But it's when might grabs a hold of our heart. It is an operation of the Holy Spirit and the spirit of might typically is related to understanding and revelation. Sometimes, just out of nowhere it seems, of course we know it's the person of the Holy Spirit, our heart is energized and gripped with a divine confidence, the spirit of might. It's something that comes upon us. But more times than not, that spirit of might is, released, is related to a surge of understanding that enters our heart. And again, that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's called the spirit of revelation. That spirit of understanding takes a hold of our heart and we feel like, we're, like we could stand before any great giant. And that's what's happening in David's experience right here. A spirit of might is laying a hold of him because he sees something about the plan of God and he has this courage, he has this unwavering heart that the Word of God declares is beautiful before the Lord. That tranquility, that uniqueness of a single heart that doesn't waver before challenge, before threatening obstacles. It stands strong in the confidence of the Lord. And that's a facet of the beauty of God that Jesus obviously operated in. John the Baptist operated in and Jesus in a secondary way, I mean, and uh, David in a secondary way is operating here in 1 Samuel 17. Tonight we're going to look a little bit on the national crisis that suddenly was erupting before the leaders of Israel and how a young shepherd, God introduces him into the national life of Israel by this crisis. And of course, we understand that often God will allow a crisis to be the, the circumstances of which He introduces new dimensions of your experience in the Lord. You've heard it said before that without a challenge, without a, without a battle, there can't be a victory. You know, the definition of a victory comes out of defeating the obstacle that appears before us. Now what happens typically is the obstacle appears before us and our hearts just, just collapse under the weight of fear before the obstacle. But when, when the Lord allows us to see where things are going, we can see the big picture of God's hand and where He's taking our own individual lives as well as the people of God then the spirit of might takes a hold of our heart and we can stand before obstacles looking at God as our source instead of looking at, at human provision as our source. First Samuel 17 is a very familiar story. It's a story that is a favorite in children's church. But this is far more than just a nice story. This was an actual fact in history. There was a national crisis that suddenly broke into the life of Israel. The Philistines, the most formidable enemy of Israel at that time, they had a decided advantage because they had discovered iron 
just before the Israelites did. At this very time in, in uh, Israel's history, the Philistines had iron and Israel did not have iron yet. It was just beginning to be passed over to the nation of Israel, the ability to make iron. So they had swords, and so therefore they had a tremendous advantage in battle. And so the Philistines have gathered on one side of the mountain. It says there in verse 1, the Philistines have gathered their armies together to battle. Verse 2, they were gathering on each side of the valley of Elah, and they drew in battle array against the Philistines. The army of Israel against the army of the Philistines. You can just picture it. But the, but the Philistines have a larger army, and they have iron weapons. Now, remember, what's happening is that whatever the outcome of this battle is, the Philistines, which look like they would defeat Israel, if they do defeat Israel... They kill all of the men. This is no, you know, peace agreement kind, kind of deal. They will go in and slaughter all of the men that could be, would be warriors. They rape the women and they enslave the children. This is, this is a full-scale national crisis that's going on. In Israel, because their king is now demonized, these fits of demonic rage come upon Saul that drive him to the brink of insanity. Well, he's, he's moving in and out of insanity. The Spirit of the Lord has left their king. So he's not, he doesn't have the power to stand in courage, nor does he have the power to incite or inspire courage in those that are around him. And so the nation is without protection in some ways. Verse 3, the Philistines stood on one side of the mountain. Israel stood on the other, the great valley between them. Verse 4, suddenly the champion appears from the camp of the Philistines. His name was Goliath. His height was six cubits and a span. He's approximately nine feet and nine inches. He's just under ten feet in height. He was the mighty champion of the army of, Phil of, of the Philistines. He appeared unstoppable, and by human agency, he was unstoppable. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail that weighed, the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, put 120 pounds. He has a, an iron helmet. He has a 120 pound vest on to protect him from, a, from a, a sword or a spirit of some sort of which, of course, would be inferior to their swords. Verse 6, he had a bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And the spear head weighed 600 shekels, put 15 pounds, was the weight of the head of the spear was 15 pounds. This man was literally a giant. Verse 8, he stands in the spirit of accusation, like the enemy always comes, and he cries out to us relentlessly, day and night for 40 days and 40 nights, he came and he cried out against Israel in the spirit of accusation. You want to put unrelenting accusation. This is the enemy's tactic, the enemy's strategy to break down and, and undermine the spirit of courage, the spirit of might. And he stood and he cried out in verse 8 to the armies of Israel. Why have you come out to line up for battle? In other words, you're hopeless. Why go through the exercise you know you're going to lose? How common we know that spirit of accusation, that spirit of despair, that hopeless spirit. We say, why is it even worth the hassle? We know that we will never break through. To back up a little bit, this great national crisis has two primary applications. I should have introduced it with, with, with this point. The first application speaks of the corporate battle between the people of God and the enemies of God. The corporate battle. Will the church be snuffed out and just dwindle down to nothing as the gates of hell prevail, or will the church, in fact, prevail against the authority of hell? There's a corporate dimension to this great drama, this great conflict that's acted out in real life and blood issues in the life of David. This is not just a story. This is real. Real fear, real tears, real faith, real risk. The whole thing is real.
The application is first corporate. The corporate people of God. Will we in fact be defeated or will we defeat the enemies of God? The second application is individual. The enemies are not the Antichrist kingdom and all of the governments, the political powers standing against the church and martyrdom and all the things that will come to a, a full head at the end of the age, which, by the way, martyrdom right now in 1998 is at an all-time high in, Christian, in church history. There are more martyrs right now than any other time in church history. Some people say very naively martyrdom is going to break out again. Beloved, it's already at record heights right now across the world. It's not something that is going to break out. It's already broken out. It will touch the Western world before it's over. But that will be the glory of the church because the power of might, the spirit of might, this courage that beautifies our life, that makes us look so different than the common mere man for which we are no longer mere men, Paul the Apostle would say in 1 Corinthians 3, 3. We are people with an identity rooted in the uncreated God who became man, Christ Jesus. We're not mere men, 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. We're people with a spiritual identity that identifies us to the beauty and the power and the, and the victory of the Son of God. The first application is corporate. The second application is individual. And we feel the hopelessness. We feel the spirit of despair at both levels. We look at the church corporate and we say, will revival ever come? Will sin and will the enemy governments, and there's many applications from literal governments just to the powers of darkness working in amongst the church, will they defeat the church or will we in fact be victorious? And then there's the individual application. As we battle lust, as we battle fear, as we battle bitterness, as we battle spiritual boredom, as we battle spiritual barrenness, Will we ever have the spirit of prayer? Will we ever love the Word of God? Will we ever be able to hear God's voice? Will we ever rise up in victory to where we feel love for God in our heart? Those are the great giants to stand before us individually. And then, of course, before us corporately, will the church always be like this? And I, I believe that 1 Samuel 17 is a, is a, uh, a dramatization, but a real one, but it's very dramatic depicting the struggle and the principles of victory before us in the life of this young warrior king, this, this young worshiping warrior, David. In verse 8, that hopeless cry, that unrelenting cry, we'll see uh, in verse 16, he came 40 days, morning and night, verse 16, relentlessly the spirit of accusation comes. And in verse 8, here's what the spirit of accusation says, Why have you come up to line up for battle? It's not even worth the effort. You might as well just accept the fact that your heart is dull and cold and you don't move in the love of God. You're different. You will never be a woman of prayer. You will never be a man that is successful in the things of God. Why bother to line up in battle array? Why bother with intercessory prayer? Why do warfare through worship? Why study the Word of God and believe for a great reformation and a revival that explodes across the land? Beloved, that's the spirit of the enemy. It's an age-old ta tactic of Satan's kingdom. He comes and whispers unrelentingly in our ear. Forty days and forty nights, verse 16 says. Never stops. Verse 9. Again, we're, we're not covering every point in principle because that's not the approach we're taking in this course. But only in as much as it will bring us to the discovery of the beauty of the Lord through David's experience. Verse 9. Here's the, here's the battle. I mean, here's the, uh, the deal. Goliath said, if your champion is able to beat me, in essence, I'm summarizing, then we'll serve you. But if I prevail against him, you serve us. Satan breathes like a dragon roaring, breathing fire down the neck of the church. If I defeat you, if I can take out your champions, I have you all. And we say, no. Our champion is the Lord Jesus. You could not take him out. He's already prevailed, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Verse 10, it goes from despair to defiance. Verse 10, I will defy the people of God this very day, the body of Christ. He goes from hopelessness, in verse 8, to blatant, in-your-face defiance. Hopelessness becomes utter hopelessness, defiance. And our hearts tremble with fear. All of Israel heard the words, verse 11. Look at the 
impact. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. Right now, the church of Jesus Christ across the Western world is dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, the church doesn't feel like they're greatly, greatly afraid because we are so far entrenched in the comfort zone, we have nothing to fear. We have drawn the battle lines out there against the enemy, and we're so in the comfort zone, there's so little risk that we're taking that we don't see the fear. But when the Spirit of the Lord begins to put His hand upon a congregation, upon a group of people, and says, lift your voice, blow the trumpet, take a stand, live a radical different way, you go to the edge then. And then all of a sudden, even the people of God rise up and say, you're going too far. And all of a sudden, the issue of fear and dismay becomes a real issue. As long as you're fast asleep in the comfort zone, we don't feel the dismay and the fear. But you're a people that want to go the full distance. And so every now and then we go out there a little bit further than we're uh, 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 accustomed to, than we're comfortable, and we feel the fear, and then sometimes we'll back away until things settle down again. The Lord says, lift your voice, take a stand, live different, be different, believe for things different, and allow the scoffers to scoff and do not yield to fear. Beloved, if you take a stand, the scoffers in the church and outside the church will scoff. And when the scoffers scoff, our uncertainty becomes manifest. Lots of times something will happen and somebody will lift their voice and the people will gather and it's kind of like a, uh, you know, it's everybody's just kind of uh, living off of the adrenaline and the excitement of the other. And then the scoffer's voice, the voice of Goliath, the enemy is heard and then all, everybody scatters. The Lord is looking for a few good men and women that will take a stand. And they say, our inheritance is not mainly on the earth, only secondarily on the earth. Our inheritance is somewhere else. Let the scoffers scoff, believers or unbelievers. We're going the whole distance like the New Testament describes. Verse 16, it's relentless, night and day, night and day. It reminds you of Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Satan accuses, how often? Night and day. Night and day he is whispering. Uncertainty destroys our resolve to move on in partnership, in mature, bridal partnership with the Son of God. Uncertainty destroys our resolve to have bridal partnership. Well, what will my friends and family say? What, what will the people say? It looks a little strange what I'm doing. I don't have the same values they have, and they claim Christ as well. David said in Psalm 69, we'll undoubtedly get to it sometime, it's one of my favorites about David's inner resolve in his personal life before God. He says, zeal for your house has consumed me, God, in Psalm, 60, Psalm 69, verse 7 and 8. He goes, zeal for you has consumed me, but here's what he adds to it. He goes, you have, that zeal has made me an alien and a stranger to my family and to my friends. I look like a stranger to them. They don't even recognize me because the zeal of God has laid hold of me. They looked at David and they wagged their head. They said, you're over the edge. But he says, zeal for God has laid hold of me. David knows what it means to have resolve birthed in him, rooted and grounded in the spirit of might. And that really is rooted and grounded in the spirit of revelation, what we looked at in our last sessions. Verse 21. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army, there it is. The conflict is breaking out in our nation right now. Verse 24. Well, verse 23. David's listening to it. He's hearing all the, the talk. The end of verse 23. David heard it. He's listening just as a young man bringing some supplies up. I trust that you'll read the chapter in fullness and the assignment in the A.W. Pink book. David is, is coming up and he's overhearing. He goes, what, what's going on here? He's been gazing on the beauty of the Lord in creation. He hasn't really confronted any military situations. He's going, I don't understand what's happening right now. Why are we, everybody so afraid right now? Isn't it God who spoke? Verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him, were dreadfully afraid. It says in verse 11, Greatly afraid. In verse 24, dreadfully afraid. They, they fled. How many of the body of Christ? I, I remember when, when we were going through some, some uh, 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 how, how do I want to say it, some introductory, that's what I want to say, introductory uh, troubles when people were rising up against us everywhere. Introductory, because in the big picture, the Lord looks back and says, that was grade school. I was teaching you addition and subtraction. That was it. Algebra 2 or calculus. 
ridiculous. You had a couple of people on the radio in a few places say that you were liars and you were off the wall and were stupid. And, and a number of people in our church, not that many, but they said, it's too heavy. It's just too wearisome. I can't come to a church and deal with this. It's like, beloved, check out the end of the age where this thing is going. The Lord's saying, I'm just whispering. I'm just giving you a little pop quiz to, 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 to get you to take a stand. I'm not trying to be mean about that, but what I'm trying to say is, those introductory shakings, those little rumblings are nothing. God wants the people of God not to flee, but to stand strong in the, in the spirit of might. But typically, the rule of the day is God raises up a few men and a few women that have the spirit of might on them, and it's contagious. It's imparted to others. The spirit of might is something that we have directly in our life with God, but it's something that is, in a secondary way, imparted to others. It's like a crutch that kind of helps them over the troubled times so they can get a hold of God themselves. The spirit of might is contagious. Verse 25, and so the men said, the men of Israel said, have you seen this man? Get a grip. Have you seen the facts? I mean, immorality is at all time high. I mean, the church is backsliding everywhere. Nobody's taking a stand in prayer. I mean, the prophetic is not worth the price that it costs to take a stand for it. Have you seen the power that Satan has as the enemies of God begin to be increased in their manifest power? Surely he has come to defy Israel. Beloved, when that arrow strikes your heart, surely we will lose. You take it out and throw it down and put your heart before that flame of fire called the Word of God so that that fire can melt the coldness of our heart, the natural coldness of our heart. And David spoke to the man, verse 26. He says, what will be done for the man that kills the Philistine, who takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this un uncircumcised Philistine? Uncircumcised, what that means, the point of it is, a man out of covenant with God. Who is this man that has no relationship to God, talking to the people related to God? We're in covenant. He's not in covenant. What's the point? Maybe it's within the body of Christ. People that are in covenant with God, but they don't have the word of the Lord burning in their heart. We don't have to live by their intimidations. If we have the word of the Lord, beloved, we can stand in might. He says, who is this guy anyway, this man out of covenant that he should defy us? The people answered in the manner saying, so shall it be to the man who kills him. Now Eliab. Now remember Eliab back from chapter 16. He was the older brother. He was the one that Samuel first was going to pour the, the oil on. Eliab's got a problem with his little brother David. You know, eighth down the line. Eliab says, you took my spot, little guy. And you really think you're something special, don't you? And he accuses him. Eliab's anger rose and he accuses David of pride. He goes, David, you don't have anything happening in God. You're just filled with pride. And though it's often true that the anointed of the Lord have elements of pride in their life, one of the tried and proven arguments to undermine the anointed of the Lord is the old pride argument. Because the truly sincere will be, have paralysis by analysis. They will be so preoccupied by their, their seeking to be right that the very analysis will paralyze them. I mean, there's a place where we know we've heard from God and we take a stand and they will rail us from every corner of the scoffers from within and without the community of God and we take our stand. I'm not saying we don't have a teachable spirit. But we can, we can, over, we can uh, misappropriate this, find ourselves in big trouble. David says, what have I done? Is there not a cause? What a statement. There was a book that was written some years ago called from this verse, Is There Not a Cause? Beloved, let me ask you a question. Isn't there a cause to get up out of our beds and give ourselves to God in an extraordinary way? Isn't there a cause at the end of the age? Is there not a cause that's worthy of extraordinary lifestyles before God? We live as though this is going to be just like it was a hundred years ago. I believe with all of my heart, we are at the beginning of the generation that will culminate in the most dramatic hour of human history. I believe that the power demonstrated in Genesis 1. Think about the power demonstrated in Genesis 1. 
God is going to have the same zeal at the end of human history as He had at the beginning of human history. The application will be different, but the zeal of the Lord of hosts at the end of natural history will equal the power He operated at the beginning of natural history. You read the book of Revelation and how this thing culminates with the sky filled with flaming fire and the sun not working. The power that created the sun will stop the sun. The Genesis 1 power will be on display in a different application at both ends of natural history. I talk to people and they say, this thing about the miracles, because I, I like one of my favorite things when I'm at conferences, I say, the miracles done with Moses in Exodus, and the miracles done with the apostles in Acts. Very, very different, the nature of the miracles. And I don't want to go off on that, but I go, Exodus and Acts, combined and multiplied on a global dimension, is what's going to happen in the end time church. Exodus and Acts, combined and multiplied. And there's many dimensions to each one of those different types of miracles. They're very, very different in nature. I've had all kinds of men of God in the body of Christ said, that's ridiculous. They said, when you've got Genesis 1 on your resume, doing the book of Exodus is nothing. If you're the God that did Genesis 1, the book of Acts is a whisper. It's a, it's a, it's a, a picture of restraining power. If you can do Genesis 1, the book of Acts is nothing to God. Nothing. Is there not a cause? I challenge you tonight. Is there not a cause? Isn't there something worth being different about in this generation? I say there is. Of course, you believe it as well. You wouldn't be sitting in this room. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Oh, I love the spirit of faith. This apostolic courage, the spirit of might. He said, you know, I understand you're having a little fear, but not because of him. He's not even in covenant with God. He doesn't have the word of God. I mean, if you're going to be fearful, that's one thing, but not because of Goliath. Not because of his words. They have no power because God won't back up Goliath. Goliath's words have no power because God won't back them up. When the enemy rails against us, he has no power because God won't back up the enemy. Oh, he has power a little bit, to test and to train the body of Christ. The power that God has allowed the enemy to operate in is for one purpose, to train the body of Christ in reigning and ruling in the power of God. That's why we, the, the enemy has a little bit of power. Saul said to David, you're not able to, even Saul, hear this, has no Holy Spirit on him. He can't recognize the Spirit of God on this young man. Unanointed leaders cannot recognize the anointing when it begins to merge and break forth. And I don't want to get real heavy onto that because I don't want to, us to fuel up a critical spirit. I remember hearing Reinhard Bonnke preach on 1 Samuel 17 one time. Reinhard Bonnke, the, the, uh, uh, I say the great evangelist from Germany. And the reason I say great isn't because he speaks to a million people at a time, which he does. I say great because I've had the chance to be with him a number of times. He's a man of abandonment to God. So I'm using the word great to describe his character, not his influence. He's a great man. Reinhard Bonnke is just, he has no, he has no, no energy for anything. I mean, it's, I, I remember one time uh, being able to be on a trip with him, and we went to bed at 1 o'clock in the morning, and we got up the plane. Well, I had to catch it at 7, so we're there at 6, and I mean, I am just whipped, and, I, and I'm totally exhausted. And sitting across the table, and I'm talking to him and his wife, Ann. I'm saying, well, Reinhardt, you know, what, what do you do, you know, in this and that and the other, he says, <laughs> I can see him right now, he goes, now don't be condemned by this, just let this guy flow in the way God made him. He said, I have no time and no energy for any of those things. He says, all I see is a blood-washed Africa. He says, from Cairo to Cape Town, he says, I see nothing, none of these other things, a blood-washed Africa. It's all that I see, it's all I live for. And here I am, you know, I've got a little bit of energy, and I'm kind of like taking a step back. It's 6 a.m. in the morning. We've been in bed a few hours, you know. I had two, only two cups of coffee. And I look at his wife. I said, wow. She says, my dear Reinhardt, it's always like this. I looked at him. I said, I've met, I've met my match, and I am defeated soundly. I said, really? I said, Reinhardt, you need to relax. He says, I have a vision. And I said, okay, okay, let's not go there again. <laughs> no, it, it, was, it was awesome. It was awesome. How did I get onto Reinhardt Bonnke? What verse am I at? Oh, 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 yeah, I was telling about 
he was talking about First Samuel 17. He gave the, he, 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 gave the, uh, he said there's four, there's four people in First Samuel, four, four groups in First Samuel 17. I loved it. He said number one, there's the ex-anointed professional, Saul. The ex-anointed professional. I said, yeah, that's right. The ex-anointed professional, he's Saul. Number two group, there's the unanointed professionals. That's the army of Israel, Saul's boys. Unanointed professionals. They just follow him around, dressing like he has, whatever hairstyle he has, they have. They just mimic everything he does. They're unanointed professionals. They were the cabinet of Saul. Then he said, then there's the anti-anointed. That's Goliath. Real power, but on the wrong side. And he said, and then there was the anointed unprofessional, David, young David. The anointed unprofessional. And he says, and when the anointed unprofessional goes against the anti-anointed, the professional ex-anointed and the unanointed professionals always resist him. Always they rise up to resist him. He says, the professionals will always rise up to stand against the young Davids when they take a stand against the anti-anointed. He says, just get used to it. He's talking to a whole group of pastors. So Saul says, here's this ex-anointed professional. You're not able to stand. And he gave him a bunch of reasons why God couldn't work on his behalf. Beloved, that's the ex-anointed professional at his best. Giving a list of reasons why it can't work for him to believe God. I remember when I was just a young man. 21, 22, 23, 24. And I don't mean this critically. I'm just, I'm just wanting to encourage some young people. I remember four or five men of God that I went to. I mean, I opened my heart wide to them. And I was, try, I was reading books on prayer and revival, and I was trying to find a man of God that was 40 or 50 or 60. I was at 20. This went on for a number of years. Who could encourage me as to the reasonableness of spending four or five hours a day in prayer. Because, you know, if this is the end of the age and intercession is so vital, and could I do it a little bit with you? I couldn't find a man of God that was over 40 years old, that was over 30 years old, that took prayer serious. I'm not saying there wasn't any. I couldn't find one. And every man of God I talked to gave me reasons why it was not practical to persevere in prayer. I said, I'm, dr I'm going crazy right now. These were men of God I, I greatly esteemed. Every one of them looked me in the eye and said, it's unreasonable what you're doing. And I walked away, I mean, brokenhearted. It was not a small thing. I was devastated about the first four or five times. Then I just settled the issue. This is just how it is today in the body of Christ. But I'm not going that way. And by the grace of God, the Lord's helped me for those 20 years. I just wanted to find a man of God to give me a reason and a way to do it, to press in. And every one of them gave me reasons not to stand. I said, what is going on here? And Saul said in verse 33, you're not able to stand. Look at that. You're a kid. You're just a youth. You don't, you don't understand the practicality. You can't give yourself to God that way because, you know, there's all these other dimensions. I remember saying to, to some of them, I said, I don't want some of those other dimensions. I don't really want those. And I don't mean to be the hero of my own story, but I'm just sharing the... I mean, that was a painful reality in those four, about four or five years. And then I just decided not to expect much, just to go ahead and go for it. He says, you're just a youth. Well, there's one good thing about the youth. There's one thing about youth. They're like, it's like the wet cement. It hasn't dried yet. They're still ready. They're still willing to ride on it before it dries. Once that cement dries, and it dries wrong, you have to get the jackhammer out and break up the foundation through a lot of turbulation, a lot of trouble. So sometimes, well, usually the youth are reckless and a little out of touch with some things, but if they got a fire, we need to see some anointed older men and women in the church that help that fire grow into maturity without putting the fire out. David, in verse 34, after Saul gives a number of reasons, and you can develop this. It's a fantastic list there. He gave the expertise of, of, of Goliath, of Satan's kingdom. Why Satan is so successful? He's a man of war from his youth. He has a history of, of victories. Don't challenge him. Accept the status quo. 
David said, yeah, but I killed a lion and a bear. The spirit of might came upon me. This isn't the first time. Beloved, God doesn't typically start you out in a national crisis. He gives you personal victories of a smaller nature. But require the same spirit. I mean, a lion and bear is pretty serious. I remember, you know, going to the, the zoo and seeing a lion. It's scary. I went to the safari in East Africa where there was nothing between me and the lion but a glass in the car, you know, and the guy with his foot. I said, did you get that foot ready? That, giant, that lion was giant. I went, whoa, this thing is bigger than the zoo. And it's scary. They said they could knock this car over. It was a little, uh, little cheap little car, a little tin car. He said, uh, that lion could knock this car over. I says, what's the chances of this motor getting something going wrong? He says, it's not very likely. I says, well, let's keep this thing revving. It was frightening. I thought of King, young David. To kill a lion and a bear takes the spirit of might. The same spirit that was on him to take on Goliath, but at a lesser, at a lesser degree. There's personal vic victories that God begins to release the spirit of might in our individual life, and in our secret life, before He does it in our public life. We don't start operating in our public life with Goliath, we start in our private life tackling some monumental issues, but in our personal lives, the lion and the bear. Verse 36, your servant. David's talking about himself. He goes, I've killed them both. And I'm telling you, the enemies of God will be just like them because it's the same spirit of might. Verse 37, God will deliver me. God will deliver me. God will deliver me. I, the power of God's upon my heart right now. This wasn't natural courage. This was the spirit of might. Verse 38, so what does Saul do? He puts on to David Saul's armor. He says, well, then let me put on you my professional armor. Now that you're going to take a stand, let me bring you up like I was brought up. Let me put my warfare, my garments on you. Beloved, you can't wear Saul's garments. David says here in verse 39, he goes, they're not tested. He goes, I, I, I've not, I don't have any personal experience in your way, Saul. I, I don't have, my faith doesn't operate according to the way you operate. I, I can't wear your garments. I have to have my own call. I've had people, young people ask me, they want to do what I do. And I think of this verse. You can't wear another man's armor. You have to wear your own. In this case, it was a negative. You can't walk in another man or another woman's calling. You have to have your own commission from the Lord. Verse 42, the Philistine looked at him and saw David. He was, and he disdained him. He mocked him. He laughed at him. He said, you have to be kidding. Verse 43, the Philistine said, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks because he had the slingshot? The enemy was insulted by David's confidence in the Lord. Verse 44, the Philistine said, I'll kill you. In verse 45, David said back to him, You come to me with a sword. You come to me with all your political machinery. You come to me with all of your technology. You may have every radio station and every TV station, every president of the earth behind you. You may have $10 million. You come to me with a sword. I don't care what kind of machinery you come against me with. Because a sword and a spear and a javelin he had the iron. They were a step up from the armies of Israel. But I don't need the machinery. I don't need the advanced weaponry of the day. I come to you in the name of the Lord. I've heard from God. I come before the God you have defied. And He is moving. He is whispered in my heart. And that was key. David had the word of the Lord in his heart. And God will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you and I will take your head from you, and this day, this is key, verse 46, I will give the carcasses of the army of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, to the beasts of the earth, and all the earth will know there's a God in Israel. The reason I quote that, because in Revelation 19, verse 11 to 17, two times the, John the Apostle quotes this phrase. David is tapping into something that has eschatological dimensions to it. He's standing before a giant where the, the power of God is going to break in and intervene. Because when the birds of the air came, that, that's a phrase used in the Bible on, on several occasions. The birds of the air will gather. Because when, you, when a general would go to war, he would slaughter and all the corpses would be laid on the ground. They would then retreat and go back to their, 
to their uh, uh, city or town, and they would look back a couple miles, and there would be thousands of buzzards flying in the air, which was a sign for all to see the great battle was over and the slain were multiplied throughout. It was like a sign, like a neon sign pointing for miles and miles. When the birds of the air gathered, there's a great slaughter that just happened. The enemies have been defeated. And that's a little bit of what's going on there. It's a prophetic statement that all the earth will know. David's slipping into the spirit of prophecy. And then the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with technology. There's nothing wrong with technology, but we don't trust it. So and so has more clout. He has more money. He has more everything. It doesn't matter. If we have the word of the Lord, it doesn't matter what so and so has, believer or unbeliever, if they stand against the word of the Lord. But all the assembly know, let the body of Christ know that God isn't saved by all of the machinery. For the battle's the Lord's, and He'll give you into our hands. The guy says, I run into young men and women and old men and women all the time that have a real chip on their shoulder because they said, if I would get a platform, then I know my ministry would take off. And I've been around to know that giving somebody a platform is not the way to, to jumpstart their ministries. I know that. I've watched for 20 plus years. I've seen a number of guys get a platform, then two years later they're right where they were and they're, and they're mad. They think, if I could get, in to get the mailing list or get some profile or get Charisma Magazine to back me up or get the key guys to say my name or endorse something, then it would work. Beloved, it doesn't come down to that kind of stuff. Someone may do that for you here and there. At the end of the day, there's a life of God that's released in you or there isn't. And I don't care how famous the guy is, he can give you a platform and maybe ten people will, you know, different meetings will have you come, but it will all fizzle out to nothing. Water reaches its own level in due time. And I look at folks and I say, man, I've heard this so many times, I can't even hardly bear it one more time. I go, the battle isn't the machinery. It's the life of God and the commissioning of God. Go fight some lion and bear in your personal life and the Lord may have you take on a Goliath sometime. Of course, the great thing about David, David didn't care about Goliath, lions, or bears. David wanted to love God and live before God, and that's what gave David power. And all the assembly will know the Lord is not saved with the sword of the Spirit. For the battle is the Lord's. He will give you, He will give you into our hands. So it was, verse 48, that the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. And David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. I mean, how unnerving. There's no intimidation in this man's heart. The re it's the real thing. It's not hype. It's not hamburger helper, you know, kind of worked over a few times. He didn't come from the conference and now he's all jazzed up. Now he wants to go do something radical that's going to phase out. This is flowing out of reality in his life with God. This is real. He's down in the valley. I mean, imagine it. I mean, the armies are both sides. I mean, there's tens of thousands on each side. This massive valley of Elah. About 15 miles from, from, from Bethlehem, from his hometown. He's down there. There's the giant on one side. And there's all the massive thousands on the other. And I mean the national security. We're talking about the men slaughtered, the children enslaved, the women raped and killed. I mean, this is serious. This isn't a game. This isn't something just so they can stay up late and have, you know, over pizza and tell the story about how cool it was. This was reality. This was reality. And David... I'm not talking about his natural courage here. I'm talking about the spirit of might, because when the spirit of might went on him, he, he shook like a leaf. But I tell you, he put himself in front of that fire. He put, the word of, he put his heart in front of the presence of God and the spirit of might. He became vulnerable to it. He became accessible to it. He didn't live in it nonstop, but he had experiences of it more than he would have if he wouldn't have postured himself before God. The spirit of might is not something we can control, but it's something we can be accessible to by giving ourselves to the Lord. Because you know what happens? Part of the spirit of might is, part of fearlessness, the beauty of fearlessness is, the beauty of courage is, courage isn't just that God makes your heart pound with boldness. Your heart gets more courageous when the list of things you have to have goes down. Part of the makeup of courage is not wanting very many things. Therefore, you don't have to maintain them. You don't have to fight for them. You don't have to worry about them. And you don't have to spend all of your energies keep propping them up. But look at David, verse 48. David hurried. He ran. Here's the Philistine. He's running at him. He says, this is real. It's the real thing. It's not just, it's not a hype deal. It's the real thing. He goes, I know. 
I know. There's no intimidation in me right now. I know David's saying, this is for real. I remember how many times, I know a few times in my life where the Lord really touched me and I, I made the bold stand. And afterwards, it's like, oh, Lord, what I would do for the spirit of might now. I remember one time, I'll just give you an example. So we're getting to the end of the chapter. And the end of the session, but I remember one time in 1984, our church was just about a year and a half old. And we were renting a facility, and the Lord had already given us uh, two or three pretty substantial supernatural provisions financially. Some pretty uh, 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 substantial, meaning it got our attention as a church. This is 1984, the summer of 84, and I said, we've got to get a building. Everybody says, yeah, we do. So I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go seek the Lord and find out what the Lord says about a building. There's ten ways to get a building. How does the Lord want us to get a building? I don't want to do it how the other guy got a building. I don't want to wear someone else's armor. I want to do it for us. So I go, and I, I love to tell the story. I went to offer a week of prayer and fasting, and, I, and it took me about three years. I honestly didn't, wasn't being deceptive. I just never remember. But I, I remember I only fasted like about a, a half a day. Every, the whole church prayed for me, and I came back and told the story, and they all clapped. But I forgot to fast when I went, meaning it just kind of like didn't happen. But anyway, but the church laid hands on me, the whole church, to go pray and fast, you know, to go off for a week. And I felt stirred to do it. I came back, I literally heard the word of the Lord. I mean, in, in a way that I was, it was definitive. And I got back and I said, I've heard the word of the Lord. And everybody's cheering, yeah, praying, fasting works. But again, it took me three years to tell them because I literally forgot to, to mention that. I remember the Sunday morning when I was telling the story and I told them I didn't fast and a bunch of guys were screaming. It was really fun. But anyway, the Lord says, go back. Give all your money to the poor as a church. And every week, just keep giving all your surplus to the poor. Everything that you have and save nothing, and I'll give you a building. I got up. Spirit of might. I mean, it, it was real. I said, we're going to give. We had a little of the reserves. We're giving everything away. And every week, we're going to give everything away. Yay! I mean, everybody, about maybe 800 people in the church cheering. And yay, this is God, and this is noble. Well, that was great. Now it's like about eight weeks later. We have zero money. And the people are going like, well, we're going to get a building anyway. I said, well, I mean, the Lord said he'd give us a building. Like, when? I don't know when, where. I don't know where either. And I remember feeling that little palpitations going, oh, my goodness. I mean, I've done it this time. But it really was the Lord. And so when the Spirit of Mike comes on you, it's not like it never, ever lifts or it never, ever wanes. But when it's there, it's there. And then the Lord provides us this building in the most astounding way. One of the prophetic Men stood up on February 1st. On February 1st, he prophesied, he said, in four months, by June 1st, two, the Lord's going to provide the building He promised you. This was February 85. This was like six or eight months later from the summer. In February, he says, within four months, by June 1st, the Lord will provide a building for you. And we're meeting in rented facility. No, we're, we're, we're meeting at the high school auditorium. Everybody cheers. I'm a little unnerved by that because... Four months is like comes real fast. I thought it's a great meeting, but what, you know, what if? I mean, it's, it's a great thing, and everybody was happy. But what if it's not real? You know, two guys came up in business suits, just like you said, on about May fifteenth. We're two weeks away, and I mean, I'm getting nervous. Two guys asked me for a lunch. Me and Noel Alexander met with us, and they told us about this building. They said some problems came. We would like you to take it. Listen, on June first, we'd like you to give you the keys. I looked at the Lord and I go, Lord, that's how this stuff works. We gave the, the money away. The spirit of might was there. It lifted for a while. I mean, it really did. There was a struggle. I just got to tell you that part. The Lord gave us this building. We had it paid for debt-free in three years. It was a magnificent thing that the Lord did. And there's so many sub-stories, sub-parts to the story. Verse 48, David hurried out. David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone. He slung it, struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead. He fell on his face to the earth. He fell on his face to the earth. I, I like that. That's reminiscent. David would later say that the Lord will cause all of the enemies of God to become a footstool for the Messiah, for the Lord. Goliath is a picture of the enemies of God laying prostrate before God, flat on his face. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. 
struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. There was no machinery. God's not against machinery. He just doesn't want us to count on it. Always in ministry, there's, it's how big the profile is, therefore we have confidence. I tell you, the Lord can shut something big down in a moment, and He can breathe on something small and make it big, but neither of them are great because of their size, either way that it goes. Something is great because the heart of God is manifest in the heart of the people that are a part of it, not because of its size. David prevailed. There was no sword in his hand, verse 50. David ran, stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it, and killed him with his own, with his own machinery. The champion was dead. Look at verse 52. The spirit of faith comes on everybody. They arose, shouted, pursued. And again, this isn't, I'm not calling them hypocrites. There is an impartation when the spirit of faith is upon a small number it can spread if the others are willing and have op open spirits. There's a, when the shout of the Lord, the cry of the Lord goes forth fearlessly, it gives courage. Verse 53, then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistine and they plundered, they took back the spoil of the enemy. Jesus says, you bind the strong man and you plunder his house. They're plundering the enemy's, the enemy's house there. Amen. That can be an application in our corporate life. That's mostly how I've applied it. It can be an application in your personal life. I remember in those days where I felt so barren in my prayer life. I, I remember really saying this. I'm not being over dramatic because the Lord has, has been so gracious in this area in these last years. But I remember from age about 18 to 23, I remember legitimately feeling the despairing conclusion. It felt like a conclusion. I was despairing that I could not find any joy or, or uh, enjoyment of the Word of God. The Word of God was a burden to me to read. I remember I could not find any flow of the Holy Spirit in prayer at all for a number of years. I'm not saying it's going to take you a number of years. Every person is different. I remember complaining to the Lord, will I ever, will I ever like prayer in the Word? Will I ever have liberty? Will it ever flow like a river on the inside of me like the people that I read about in history? And I remember you say, well, that's kind of cute. No, it wasn't cute. It was despairing. I ached over that because I was convinced it would never change. I did not have faith. I believed it would never change. And I watched it change. It says in Mark 4 that the kingdom of God is like the man that sows the seed and he goes to bed at night and the seed grows and he doesn't know how it grew. He woke up the next morning and goes, the plant's there. In other words... When you're sleeping, or let's say it in other words, when you're not attending to it, when you're not measuring it, when you can't watch it and discern it, it's still growing. There was something happening in my individual life. It was growing, but I, could, I didn't watch it. I couldn't measure it. I was sleeping. I was completely unaware of it. I was going through just the putting myself before the Lord, but never aware of any change. The change was happening on the inside, though. I, I, didn't, I couldn't feel it. I didn't know it. I didn't think about it. I couldn't measure it. I was so used to not liking it. My whole identity was wrapped up in not liking prayer in the Word. I did it, but I never liked it. I just concluded, I named myself, I will never like prayer in the Word. I mean, I didn't like literally name it, but that was the profile I carried in my heart before God. I said, well, it's me again, the guy that doesn't like prayer. I mean, I literally named myself in my private life with God. In the sense that I, when I defined myself before God, it was always in a guy that would never change. I go, God, here, it's ridiculous. I would always complain. I remember a Saturday morning, morning meeting. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was 23 years old. We're having a question and answer time with some people. I'm teaching Saturday morning, <clears throat> like a new believers class or something. And this lady asks me. She looks at me. There's about maybe 50 of them there. I don't really remember. And, I could just remember that room. She says, well, how long have you enjoyed the Word like you do now? It hit me like a ton of bricks. I go, what? She goes, well, how long have you like really enjoyed the Word like you do now? I mean, you obviously enjoy the Word. And I said, I do, don't I? She goes, oh, yeah, are you kidding? You love the Word. I went, huh? I go, I don't know when that happened. I go, I love the Word. I love the Word! And she goes, and they're all looking around like, somebody, you know, Mike's losing it. 
And I literally began to weep. And I said, I can't believe it. I love the, it works for me too. I love the word. And they're going like, whoa, this is like really getting weird. I had never thought about it. I didn't know when it happened. I couldn't tell. I, did, I said, I don't know. I do though, don't I? And, it, and then I remember I lost the love for the word in prayer a number of times. And the first couple of times I lost it, I panicked. And then when it returned again, I began to build a history with God of confidence that those things do ebb and flow. And now when I feel dry, I'm as sure when I feel dry that it will become hot again in the Lord if I just stay with it. But it took me two or three cycles before I lost the panic spirit, the fear when things kind of went dry on me again. I mean, I remember the first time we dry, I go, oh, oh, I lost it's over forever again. The Lord says, no, no, because through the very way that I'm wooing you and defeating this giant, I'm, I'm creating more hunger. I'm creating a little tenderness in you. The struggle is going to give you gratitude, which will result in humility at the end of the day. Through the struggle, I'm showing you things so that you'll feel the pain when other people don't feel the love for the Word in the, in the, the presence of God. But the couple of first couple of times I, I it lifted for a few months, I was panicked. I said, it's, I, it, it was just a momentary thing that came on me. After a few cycles of that, my confidence from my personal history in God was built. I said, no, that's how it goes. It ebbs and it flows in order to give us compassion when we have victory, to give us gratitude, which is the fuel of humility in victory. To give us a little bit of understanding on how victory is, is walked out. So, beloved, let me tell you, the Goliaths in your life, all that we could give a list of 20 Goliaths you're facing. And it says, I will defy you. There's a many, many different struggles. I tell you, when the Word of God, when the prayer of the Word gets a little bit lively, just a little bit lively in your heart, you feel different about all those Goliaths. You feel different about all those Goliaths. I'm not just giving some simple, go read the Bible more and all your problems will go away. I'm saying... Open your spirit to God. Put your heart in front of the fire and your heart will feel different after time. And then the Goliaths look very different when you've got a spirit of revelation on you. Amen. Let's stand. Lord, we love you. Oh, Lord, we do love you. Lord, we say, what are these voices that defy us. Whether Goliath or whether Saul, whether from the enemy, from the camp of the enemy or from the camp of the redeemed, you can't stand. You won't be different. Lord, we say no to the voice of Saul. We say no to the voice of Goliath. Within the camp or without the camp. Yes, we might be youths in age or youths in experience or youths in our immaturity in the spirit, regardless of our age. Lord, we have Your Word growing in our hearts. We're not going to be defied. We're not going to be set down. We're not going to lose our hope. For is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to take a stand in these days? We ask You, Lord, for that, that beauty of the might of God, the courage of God to stand. I ask You to impart it into these people in the name of Jesus. Amen and Amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.